I'm, my name is Andres Freund. Uh, I work for Enterprise DB and hack on Postgres uh, way too much. And I want to talk uh, today about plug-all table access methods in Postgres. Uh, so what is a plug-all table access method in Postgres? It's basically the ability to specify how a table is going to be stored, which method it is stored with at creation time. So we can say create table, table name, the, otherwise the specification of the table, and then say using heap or using another method. And I worked with allowing different table access methods uh, for a good bit of the last year. And uh, this was in collaboration with uh, Harry Barukomi, Alvaro Herrera, Ashtash Bapat, Alexander Korotkov, Amit Kandekar, and Dimitri Dolgov, and a lot of other people. So this was a lot of work, but it's definitely not just mine. So what do I mean by uh, that you can switch around the table storage? It's basically the way that a table store is store, uh, the table can store data, and table here is not just tables, also materialized views, uh, can differ. You can have different trade-offs. You might have heard of something like columnar storage. You might have heard in another talk about, in the transaction talk earlier, that it's that the, the way Postgres' heap stores data is actually not particularly optimal for a lot of workloads. So there's a lot of different ways you can store data, and we want to allow to store it in different ways. So that would be one, what we want to be able to change. And it's, when you say table storage, we don't mean that the index has, would work differently, depending on which a, a table AM uh, you're using. They will mostly work the same. There will possibly be some minor details, but you'll have the same B tree, GIN, GIST, and so on type of indexes that we have currently. And it's not just that we change the I.O. layer, as in the, it's exactly the same as the current heap, but just in memory or something. Uh, it's much more wide, much more can change, uh, change than just like the lowest level how we issue I.O. or something. And what do I mean by pluggable? Basically, the goal is to be able to uh, do create extension magic storage format, and then afterwards be able to create tables with that storage format. And you can also just say the from now on the default for this table when you create new uh, for the current connection or for the entire server going forward is going to be this other storage method. You can say it, set the configuration either inside the session or in the configuration file, and then from then on all the tables that you are created where the storage is not explicitly specified are going to use the new access method. That's so it's runtime extensible to different storage methods. That's why it's pluggable. You can plug an extension in and it works. Why do we want to do this? Uh, my, the reason I, I am working on it most directly is that uh, we want to allow to develop Zheap, which is a form of a row store that has, doesn't have some of the weaknesses that Postgres's current table uh, format has. Namely, it doesn't have as much uh, problems with bloating under heavy activity, which means that vacuuming is much, much less of a problem. And it's also much more denser uh, storage-wise, that is, more data fits into, on, into a table per, or more rows fit into a table for a given size. And that's mostly achieved by making the per row overhead much, much smaller. Uh, but also, we want to enable uh, being able to do, having like columnar uh, storage methods because like for some workloads it's pretty clear that columnar storage is much better than a row store in particular like analytics workloads or archival workloads where compression is very important and you want to be able to allow that rather than say you just can't do that with Postgres and there's a lot of crazy experiments that are just easier if you don't have to rip all out of all the storage method uh, layer out of Postgres to just experiment with how could you improve this. I think there's also good reasons why we do, wouldn't want to work on making uh, table storage pluggable. And I think the major reason, reason is that we might end up with a lot of half-baked uh, table access methods. There's other databases that have had uh, extensible <laughs> table storage, and they have a lot of different variants, and most of them have very odd different oddities. Like that, so you don't really have, like, this is your go-to because one doesn't work for this use case, one doesn't work for this use case, and one has these kind of bugs, one other has these kind of bugs. That would not be a great world to be at. Uh, 
So I think that is a danger. And I think the second uh, danger, and that's also in a problem in set database, is that there's a lot of commercial uh, storage engines that are the best thing since sliced bread, but are super expensive, and you end up needing them, even though the project is normally open source. And I think I'm a bit hesitant that that would be a good direction for the Postgres product to go to. So I think allowing that accessibility has the danger of that more people will have to pay for random uh, expensive uh, access methods because it's better for their specific workload. And it also has a large architectural impact. We had to change a lot of code to make this pluggable, like a lot. <laughs> and that, that will not just be felt by the people that had to work on Postgres 12, it will, and I'll go into my, a small bit of detail later, uh, also mean that a lot of extension authors have to do some changes to make their extensions compile, which is not nice. So what exactly do we want to do? We want to be able to have uh, multiple table access methods active in the same database. That is, we want to be able to query, for example, join a table that is defined in, with a u existing heap to z the z heap table to a column in a table, and it shouldn't break, and you sh the user shouldn't necessarily notice that when querying. It's possible that somebody else will def uh, develop like table access methods that only uh, support a very small subset of features. For example, you could very well imagine an append-only uh, access method that is optimized for that, and it would be faster to insert, but you couldn't do anything else. So the user there might then notice that you can't update because it would get an error. But outside of these kind of things, the user shouldn't necessarily notice when querying a table what type of access method it is. And we want to, as I said, them to be pluggable. That is, we can want to be able to access edit new access methods at runtime. So they don't have to be built into Postgres and we don't have to maintain every possible AM out there. And indexes should work uh, across different table AMs, and similar, uh, the planner should also work for most table access methods. And I'm going to talk a bit about the limitations around that later. One thing that's very important is that for now, we are not promising that the API for table access methods will not change, because we already know that there are limitations in the API and it will change in the next few releases every time because it's just a large enough change that we couldn't get to the perfect state in Postgres 12. So there will be iterative changes and that it will probably mean that it will have a bit of pain every time you upgrade to a new major version because there will be uh, changes. And it's also not tackling a bunch of the problem that, problems that we could tackle as part of plug, uh, th this work. Namely, we can't we haven't made some other parts of Postgres extensible, even though it would be very nice to have that. It just seemed to be a large enough project that we didn't want to tackle that at the same time. And I think the largest one that people might be bothered by is that you can't actually create a catalog tables on any of the new access methods. That's hard-coded to the current heap. Some of you might think, but, but we have uh, foreign data wrappers. How is this different? Um, and I think you can make some of the things that you can do with the table access method using a foreign data wrapper, but it's pretty awkward. The foreign data wrappers were, as the name says, built to access foreign data. They don't really support all the things we want to do with a normal table. For example, you can't actually do like proper DDL on it. You can't create indexes. And all that kind of thing doesn't work because that's not what they're made for. And you don't have proper transactional integration. You, have, you can do some things, but it's pretty hacky. You can't have like a proper commit that spans multiple uh, foreign data wrappers and the local table and expect that it actually is actually correct because you get just get something that's roughly right, which is obviously not something that you want to do for your main transactional store. You cannot have like stuff like foreign keys. You cannot have additional constraints. All that doesn't work. So in my opinion, it's pretty clear that the foreign data wrapper is very nice for what it does, but it's not built to do primary data storage. So what do we, did we have to do? This is a diagram that roughly represents how Postgres works. We have when it, which so subsystems interact when a query is being processed. The, uh, the client sends a query to the parser. The parser builds uh, something out of the query. For that, it has to sometimes query the catalog, the planner. Uh, if it's a DDL statement, then it goes to some DDL subsystem does that. If it's a normal user query, the planner executes it. Hands, uh, builds a plan, then hands that plan to the executor. That executor then sometimes accesses a heap, the heap, sometimes it also does like index accesses and then accesses the heap and so on. 
and then the heap internally sometimes access the buffer manager. The buffer manager then has to go to the storage minute that actually might read data from disk, or it might have the data in shared buffers. And lastly, if it's not in shared buffers, we then have to go to the operating system, have to read the data. The operating system might already have read the data, and uh, if not, then it has to go to disk itself. As you might notice that uh, the abstraction layers here are not particularly perfect. All the red ones are kind of abstraction layer violations. Even though we have an abstraction for heap in Postgres before 12, we bypass that abstraction in a number of places. Namely, when we execute DDL, that sometimes has to interact directly with the buffer manager. It sometimes interacts directly with the storage manager. The executor uh, sometimes in parts doesn't, it just bypasses the heap and just knows that for example, for bitmap scans, it knows that how tuples look in the heap and it just directly looks into the heap and all those kind of things. And if you want to make this extensible, obviously we can't have that because all those layering violations wouldn't work as soon as we don't have a heap as a storage. So we have to, one large part of making a table, a, a public tables storage possible was to re-architect that so all these layering violations are gone. There's a few hints, hit, bits and pieces left somewhere but basically that was the biggest part of this work. So after this, it basically looks like this. All the layering violations are basically now routed through table, the table access method. And if you have, for example, heap, then that heap all, does all the buffer manager access, to all the storage menu accesses, even if it's for DDL, because DDL now is also routed through the table access method if necessary. It's just some other access method where we don't use the other Postgres subsystems. You can write an access method that doesn't use the buffer manager. You can write one that doesn't use the storage manager. It's just a hypothetical. It's, it's a, yes. As denoted that it uses the black hole storage method. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you can just, you could write something that just doesn't use any of the buffer manager and just does, but uses the storage manager and uh, directly accesses it there. You could have one that is purely in memory and then doesn't use the buffer manager because that acts overhead. If you have to, if you already know that it's all in memory, you could, because you could have a much more optimized layout with internal pointers and all that. So it really, there shouldn't be any dependencies from above the table access method layer that assumes anything below here. There are some issues where it's not perfect, but that's basically the goal. And I'm going to talk about the problems in a bit. So how does the, do the access methods basically look like? Just we have this pre-existing PGAM table and that already is used for access methods. But until Postgres 12, that contained index access methods, which were, um, because in, index access were already extensible. You could create a new type of index in extension and it would work. In fact, Postgres since 10, 9, 6 or something has the Bloom uh, index access method that is an extension and you can just create it at runtime and it works. What you basically wanted to do is to make that extensible and that's why there's now an AM type that's called T for table and before there was index for index. Now it's both. You can, for, if you create that table, you can see that currently there is only one defined in core Postgres, but that's the existing storage method. And the way that the access method interface works is that that the AM handler has to return a struct that defines the behavior of the access method. And that's, that function here, as you can see, is, uh, has the uh, result type, the table AM handler, which is basically just a pointer to the, the struct that I'm going to show in a second. And as an argument type, it has internal. And that the reason it has internal is that we don't actually want this function to be callable from SQL. And since you can't create a data types like any internal datum on the SQL level, you can never call this on the SQL level. How does a, an access method handler look like? So that's the function that we just saw, which is basically just says, okay, I'm returning a pointer to a struct that's uh, defined, and that struct in this case is just, is, is, it has to be a uh, server lifetime, and then that uh, defines a bunch of properties about the uh, access method. In this case, it's just two examples. One is it has to indicate that it's actually a table access method using Postgres's somewhat odd version of uh, virtual object or something, inheritance. 
that isn't quite inherited, whatever. And then here, just one example callback that it has to specify. And what are the types? So, any questions so far? Cool. So the way the API looks like is, uh, I'm just going not going to go over all of the callbacks because I think there's like 42 callbacks, and that's just going to bore everybody to death. Uh, so I'm going to go over the most important ones. Um, we have, for example, uh, callbacks that are about inserting tuples because that's obviously something pretty crucial, which is basically the function that if you ever looked at the Postgres code before 12, you, there was this function called heap insert that a lot of code called by some buffer usually that just inserts a tuple. This is basically the same uh, um, um, parameters except that uh, we don't uh, pass in the tuple as a heap tuple, which was what we did before. Instead, we have this tuple table slot. And tuple table slots were a pre-existing concept in Postgres that's basically just uh, a hand, it, uh, it can hold a tuple, but the format of the tuple is not necessarily specified. Before Postgres 12, that it was used to have things like um, virtual tuples, which was, there was no heap tuple, was, we just have the, had the datums for individual tuples. We also could hold minimal tuples, which is some a condensed form of a tuple that we use for sorting and hash joins and that kind of thing, but didn't have transactional information. And now we can have additional types of tuple table slots that are used for the different AMs. For example, there's one that is, or that is, contains tuples for the heap access method, and uh, in the branch for the zheap support, there is uh, a zheap access uh, tuple table slot, and the user of those uh, tuple table slots doesn't have to know about them. That's why we can make the generic code that inserts tu uh, tuples in a t table that, that just has to deal with the tuple table slot. It doesn't know how it looks like. It just gets that from either the, u from the user input or if you have something like an insert into select, uh, insert from select, then it just is the tuple table slot that the select returns. Um, and then there's a few operations for DDL. For example, if you want have something like a truncate, what we do is we create a new relation file. We don't like truncate the old relation file, uh, file in place because we want to be able to roll back. So it has to create a new relation file. And we don't want to restrict the, uh, the table AM interface to be very specific to the way heap does that. So you just get called and you get a bunch of information. What's the new rel file node that's identified? And then is the, the table that we're creating an unlocked table, a temporary table, or a normal table? That is the one that is properly well locked and not uh, temporary. And a bunch of information that uh, you can return. Because for example, like, I don't know who of you knows what the rel uh, transaction horizon and the multi-exact transaction horizon for a table is, but not every access method would want to reuse that. Actually, probably none will, will want to reuse that, <laughs> except for heap. But so we have to be able to overwrite these uh, for each access method, because that tr triggers how often vacuum is run. And then there's f support for other DDL operations. For example, when vacuuming, not every ex um, not every access method is going to need vacuum and or it might do vacuum in a different way. So we can't have one general code that does the vacuuming. We have to instead just call a callback into to the AM and then that does the code that previous, like the, all the logic that we need to do for heap or for zheap or for the black hole FDW, uh, uh, table access method. And then we, there's also similar uh, callbacks for building indexes. Because for example, an index scan is, act, uh, an index build is actually a lot more complicated than one might think. One might think that we could just use a sequential scan of the table and insert everything, but that doesn't actually work because we have to do stuff like create index entries for uh, tuples that aren't visible anymore because another session might later then use that index even though it has a snapshot from before uh, the index was created. So it has to do stuff like index tuples that are actually already deleted if there's any other session that might still see those already deleted tuples. So that's pretty specific how that works for each AM because uh, some access methods might need to just work like heap, which basically just say, okay, we have uh, all the uh, deleted tuples uh, in line in, in the table. Others might need to go into undo and look up all the data there. And so it's, we can't really make that into general code, so it's a callback. Uh, 
for uh, various forms of scanning the table, um, we have a different set of callbacks. One is a typical, like, scan begin. Why did I copy this twice? I wanted here a different callback. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, there's one uh, callback that just starts a general scan, and then you can just say, give me the next tuple, give me the next tuple, give me the next tuple. And if you wanted to do a parallel scan, you just have to pass in the parallel scan information uh, and that just generally should work independent of how your uh, access method uh, internally works. And this one was supposed to be the uh, scan get next tuple slot or something, uh, which basically just says, give me the next tuple, give me the next tuple, give me the next tuple every time you call until it returns. I don't have any further uh, tuples. But since I copied the wrong struct, we can see that. And then there's a uh, uh, couple very specific types of scans. For example, a bitmap index scan, the way we implement that is that there first we scan the index and then we have to do a bitmap heap scan to fetch all the tuples from the heap. Because if we do build a bitmap over the tuples that we want to read, we, can't, they, we don't have all the columns. So we have to fetch them from the, from the actual table and return them. And that's a pretty specific operation that we can't just implement in a gen general way. It used to be that these, both these operations were basically implemented as part of the, the bitmap uh, scan, node, heap scan node, but like directly poking into the files basically, or into the buffer of the files, but we can't do that anymore. So we have to have a different type of scan that accesses the tuples. And there's some problem there because like, it actually doesn't necessarily make sense for all types of scans to support uh, bitmap index scans because bit, the way bitmap index scans or bitmap heap scans are efficient is that you assume that the tuple identifier has some correlation, like spatial locality uh, with the on disk location. Otherwise, you're not going to gain any efficiency. If it's just some random key, then you, it doesn't make any sense to use to do, do bitmap index scans. That's why these two um, callbacks are actually optional. Um, if they are not specified, the planner will just never generate uh, bitmap index scans. And there's always another way to, ex in Postgres, Postgres always knows how to execute a query without creating a bitmap index scan. It will just potentially be less efficient, so it's fine to uh, not implement that. There's another type of node that also cannot really be implemented in a generic manner. Yeah. That is the sample scans. We have the, for the table sample SQL class, we also have a specific node and that used to also poke directly into tables into the, like the table storage without going through heap, and we couldn't do that anymore. So there's another set of callbacks that's basically is just scan sample next blocks or something similar. And that one is actually at the moment man mandatory because at the moment there's no other way to implement a sample scan than to use the sample scan uh, because we can't, you can't just do a in normal index scan or something as to replace a sample scan. We might want to throw an error at a different place, but at the moment, the, the access method would have to throw the error itself if it were to not be able to support sample scans. And there's some, the external, for sample scans, Postgres actually has a, an extensible API to create new ways of doing sampling, and you, you can already create that at, with, like, in extensions further ones. The problem with that is that that is somewhat block-based, so there's some APIs that cannot use the table sample API because it's, assumes it's block-based, but I couldn't, we couldn't fix that at the same time. So it's probably that, that around the sample scan API that we are going to have to change things in the future. I should have got some of water. Um, so what did we have to do to even be able to uh, implement table access methods? One was that we had to remove, or we didn't have to, but we chose to remove the support of t declaring tables with OIDs because otherwise every different uh, access method would have to reinvent the magic way that heap stores OIDs in some way. And since nobody really wants to use with OIDs anymore and has been deprecated for, I think, 17 years, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be better to just remove the support instead of having duplicating all the weirdness all over and over again. Um, and that was a lot of like road work, but it's not that bad. But it will break people that want to upgrade from 11 or from early pre-12 version to 12 if they have tables with OIDs because neither PG upgrade nor PG dump will actually work anymore. You have to remove the with OIDs columns before you upgrade. 
you can still create manually create a table that has a column with OID, just type OID, named OID, and that would work. But all the magic around the column that you couldn't, that you have a column that you don't immediately see when you select from a table, you have to explicitly name it, all that is gone. Um, another, the, probably the largest change and probably the one that will break most extension is that the tuple table slot API had to change to make it general so it can hold tuples of different types. Before it could only hold three types of tuples. It could hold heap tuples, it could hold minimal tuples, or it could hold uh, virtual tuples, which was basically a tuple that only exists as part of each column internally, but not as a batch together row. And we had that, we made that abstract, so you can at runtime add new types of uh, tuple slots, and the, tu the table AM API has a, can return which kind of slot you're supposed to use for the table AM, so we don't have dependencies in the core code of what actual slot is to be used, type of slot is to be used, and that will just break extensions that use tuple slots eternally. Unfortunately, that is a number of them, because then they either have to inquire the, tuple, the type of tuple slot they to create from uh, the AM they're interacting with, or they're going to have to specify it statically if it's, for example, just a virtual tuple table slot, which is probably the most common thing. And we had to make a lot of code actually use table slots, uh, tuple slots, because a lot of the code just stored heap tuples in various places, um, which doesn't work anymore if you want to support other AMs, because otherwise they have to constantly convert from one type of tuple to heap tuple, then hand it to the other subsystem and then convert back. And they might, that conversion might not actually store all the necessary metadata to continue to be able to interact with that. So we had to just change a lot of the subsystem to work with tuple table slots, which was pretty painful because some of those are like some of the very old code, especially like the evil plan call code. It's like, there's like not very many people that understand it and it's hardly, barely tested. It's like, that was the least fun part of the whole project. Then we had to change, as I previously mentioned, that we had to fix a lot of the vi layering violations. We had to make sure that bitmap scans and sample scans didn't poke directly into the tuples. And similarly, previously, Analyze also directly po poked into the tuples. So we had to change those APIs so they didn't do that anymore. And then, as I said before, we had to route Analyze cluster and all that to table AM. There's also a few boring changes like page inspect, the extension, obviously cannot work for inspecting tables it types it doesn't know about. So all of that stuff had to get go error checks. Okay. Now I'm going to go from where we are to what we did wrong and then from what the limitations are that we might want to fix in the near future. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, so how does that work with optimization for groups like uh, people on the project? Is there like a fallback in the API? Um, because in my opinion, you don't really need to enter the right thing. So that's probably, oh, I should have added that as one of the problems because, because I did, but I didn't. At the moment, obviously that doesn't play a role for inserts, right? Because for an insert, you always need the index entries. But uh, for updates, at the moment, the update callback just returns of whether uh, it needs new index entries. Some people want to change, push all the index manipulations into the AM layer. I'm very uh, hesitant of that because there's actually a lot of weird complexity around that that we also need to fix. And if you have the, the c five copies of that code, it will get harder. But I'm very, I'm pretty sure that we're going to have to evolve that interface over time. It might be that we just delegate the index entry creation to a callback that then be called from inside the AM, but without having all the a duplicate copy of the code that does all the necessary stuff like forming the index for, uh, tuples and so on. But I don't know yet, and nobody has actually written an AM where that is problematic, so I, yeah. There's other limitations around types of it, uh, that I'm going to speak about in a few slides. Yes. 
They will, it will, your callback can just decide not to do anything. Well, it has to be, I know in the sense you have to have the callback, but it doesn't have to do anything. Some of the, I think we are probably going to have to have a separate callback that says, do I want to be vacuumed or not? It already does it for some things, namely if you don't set the frozen XID, a rel frozen XID or a rel min XID in the, the callback that I showed a few slides back, then it never does anti wraparound vacuums because those are really only necessary if you have these kinds of horizons. I think that's something where we're definitely going to have to improve. But the problem is that vac auto vacuum is so such a odd improve, imp, wor, a c area of the code worthy of improvement that I wasn't quite sure how to structure this properly without making it even worse and adding, exposing more complexity there because it has all these things of like prioritization. It doesn't quite fully work, but it has that. And it didn't like integrating something half-baked in there for some AM that we don't even know how it exists was just something that I didn't feel like was a sensible thing to do at this point. Yes and no. Um, the creation of a toast table is controlled by a callback that we just added a week ago or something. You can, like, there's a callback that says relation wants toast table or something. And if it does, then we create the proper catalog entries outside of the EAM uh, and it exists, but the delegate, like the responsibility for chunking up individual datums and sending it to the toast table all that is specific to the each AM and they have to do that internally. And then detoast is? I mean, detoast already can, you can basically have detoast call callbacks if necessary, okay. but it like would go to the, to, through the actual. Yeah. Well, it, okay. Yeah, somewhat. It's I think the best uh, description of the problem. <laughs> I think it's definitely yeah. something that we're, All toast tables are automatically at the moment created with the X method of the main table. Okay. That might or might not be the right thing. Uh, Robert Haas has recently posted a few patches that re-architects the whole toast API to be, so you don't have, at the moment you would have to copy a lot of the toasting code because it's very, there's a lot of, a bunch of weird heap specific assumptions in there. Like, hey, I assume that your tuple has a overhead of this and then it does calculations of how many tuples fit on the page and stuff like that. All of that doesn't really make sense if you're not heap. So you would have to copy some of that code and then do some minor adjustments. Robert refactored that to be more generic, but it's not in 12. Say again? Yeah? Yes. We don't want to duplicate the planner code. I'm come. There, I have a slide on that. We don't know everything yet. Wait a few slides, and if I didn't answer anything about it, then ask me again in a few slides. Uh, I tried to. Uh, some of them added a bit, like overhead. Some of them removed a bit of overhead. Um, it's, I haven't measured anything that is meaningful. Like initially there were definitely slowdowns, but in the latest round I haven't measured anything that's above like the changes you get from code layout anyway. So it's like, for me it was in a wash. There's a f one case where we are sometimes are a lot faster and sometimes are a, lot, a tiny bit slower. That is if you copy into a table and you can use the multi insert overhead uh, thing and you have exactly as many rows as a batch size, so you never actually reuse the batching, then because the creation of the state for a batch is a bit more expensive. But we also made other parts of that cheaper. So it's like, that's I think the only one where I could measure like a very small slowdown. I don't know whether, it, we could probably improve that, but at the moment it didn't seem worth of doing much more. Okay. I'll come to that in a few. So what are things that are bad and that are cannot be really excused with saying we are just going to do it later? I think one of the things that I, we just ran out of time and or energy 
is that there's a lot of confusion about function names, and that's not really just now, but there's a lot of function calls that start with heap underscore something, and it hasn't to do, actually to do anything with heap. Even if you create an index, we call heap create with catalog, and all that kind of weirdness. So there's a lot of functions that we just should rename, and a lot of files that we rename, we should rename that aren't actually created, like related to heaps, but all the names have heap in it. And it's just a very historical mess that's basically been there forever. And it would have been good to clear that up now, because now it's really weird that heap create with catalog then goes into table create <laughs> callback, and then goes back potentially into heap an.c to do that work. That layering is not exactly obvious, but I think it's mostly going to be that we have to rename all those functions to be, instead of heap create with catalog, create catalog entry for a relation or something like that. And there's a lot of that kind of boring work. There's still a few unnecessary conversions to and from heap tuples. And I'm, I'm not sure whether that should have been just on a, the list for future things because it's defensible. The problem is that the trigger interface actually expects heap tuples to uh, be passed in. And we can change that to accept the slot. The slot is passed in as part of the parameters now. Uh, but at the moment, all the PLs expect there to be uh, a, tu a heap tuple, and all the other external C triggers also expect there to be uh, a heap tuple. And we, I didn't want to break all of them. It might be possible, necessary that we have to somehow indicate whether uh, a trigger is using the old or new function call interface, uh, like uh, trigger function call interface. I don't quite know what the best way to do there is. Or perhaps we are just going to have to say, we'll just break it in v13. I don't know how many people still write C triggers themselves. Because if you just wrote triggers in PLPGSQL, we would fix that once inside the core code and you would never notice, except that things would get a bit faster. I don't know what the best answer there is. And one of the problems is that index and only and bitmap scans currently have visibility map accesses directly in them, which really isn't great. But I, we didn't get, get around to abstracting how or figuring out how the callback for that exactly would look like. And it turns out you can just return false. You can, cannot just not create the visibility map, and the behavior will be correct. It will just be a bit slower. So I don't like this, but we have to do more work. And I think if we had tried to do this at 12, we would probably have end up with an interface that sucks in different ways. So, yeah. Uh, one thing that's been longstanding but it's now really weird is that PG relation size doesn't actually go through any of the abstractions we already had. It just goes to the file system, does a stat on each uh, uh, in real segment, and sums it up in itself, which is pretty broken before this, but it's even more broken after this when we don't actually know that the table will have a relation fork that looks exactly like the current one. You could easily write heap two that doesn't, doesn't do use segments but has one big file. And that would work, but if it did chunking in smaller chunks, then it wouldn't work because it checks for one gigabyte chunks to check whether it looks at the next segment. And that should, we have the ability in the table AM to actually get the table size, but we, we, we just have to change these functions. I asked whether anybody knows why we had written them in such a weird way and nobody has replied. Uh, if anybody knows, please do. Yeah, I think those are the ugliest words. And now we come to like limitations of the API. I think one big problem is that at the moment wall logging in Postgres is not extensible. There is a generic wall format that you can use and that will work as long as you use a table storage that goes th through the buffer manager and so on. Uh, but that is actually pretty voluminous and you cannot do all the things that you might want to do in uh, uh, doing wall replay. For example, you couldn't do develop an undo-based system, uh, at least as, not as far as I can tell, because you can't recreate the undo during recovery. So that is definitely not enough. So at the moment, if you want to do write ahead logging, you either have to somehow make do with a generic xlog thing, or you have to create uh, modify Postgres to get a different type of vault uh, registered. We have discussed making wall extensible, I don't know how many times, but it's turns out to be pretty hard because you have to have a registry that you can access before the cluster is actually started because during wall replay we don't have a consistent catalog so it cannot be a catalog table and it has to work across replicas you cannot have something that works differently on a one on the primary than on a standby i kind of was wondering whether the right answer is to just say 
we have a registry in core where you say, if an extension asks, hey, please add a um, new AM type for me, then we just create that, and uh, you have to fill in those callbacks at start of time, but it's a defi well-defined RMGR ID. I don't know. It's not nice, but I can't really come up with something better. Um, I think the next biggest limitation, and I think that's a pretty large one, is that the format of how tuple identifiers look like is very, well, like, it's pretty restrictive. That's the definition like, that we had historically. We have a block ID, which is basically a reference, an offset into the, t the, the table, how may, like which block into the table you, wa uh, you want to have a table uh, access, and then we have an offset number inside that page. You can store nearly arbitrary stuff in those, so you can have an a AM that doesn't have the concept of blocks and that doesn't have the uh, concept of positions in there. You have to avoid a few values because we turn out we at the moment rely on IP pos ID, for example, to not be not zero, and the IP block ID cannot be uh, all bits set because that is the invalid number, for inval like invalid block number, and that all code outside of the AM checks that. But I think the bigger limit is that it's actually only six bytes. And that only is a problem for Postgres because we can currently cannot have tables that are larger than to the power of 32 times uh, the block size. And that's exactly this. We could have bigger tables except for this. Um, it is also something you cannot really design, uh, for example, an index organized table by this. Because the, usually the key in an index organized table will be much wider than four bytes or six bytes. So you cannot really do that unless you restrict the index organized table to be six byte integers, which isn't really very nice. The problem for that is not really the table access method side of things. That could be relatively easily changed. The problem is that indexes currently store a hard coded six bytes for each index entry to point to the actual heap tables. And we cannot just break binary compatibility by saying, oh yeah, the index entries look different now. Um, so we're going to have probably have to make the index, ex uh, index access method support variable width uh, tuple identifiers, and that probably cannot change whether it's variable width or not variable width after the creation of the index, which I think is not a problem, but that requires a fair amount of work to make that work without breaking or without regressing performance. But it turns out that we also want that feature for other reasons, namely global indexes, that is indexes that go over multiple partitions. <laughs> You also need that to have a partition identifier. Otherwise, it's very slow to drop data ever, and you don't even know which table the index entry point to, so you would have to scan all partitions or something. So it's, global indexes really need that. Uh, also, indirect indexes, that is indexes that point to other indexes, uh, also need that, and that's kind of nice to uh, reduce the uh, write amplification um, of like updates. So we probably want that at some point. Anyway, but yeah, it's a fair bit of work. I think that's the hardest limitation. There's a lot of uh, planner executor type restrictions at the moment. In sp particular, for columnar stores, we have a number of limitations. Uh, I think the biggest one is at the moment that you would normally, I think, do the columnar splitting into columns or column groups inside the AM. But right now, we don't pass the information which exact columns we are going to need properly down into the, the scans. So we, that's something that we very clearly have to improve. That would, only, would not only be beneficial for columnar stores, where it's very, very clearly needed, but also beneficial for heap, because it turns out that we, at the moment, often deformed columns that we never, never need. And we could actually improve performance there quite a bit. And I think a lot the otherwise largest uh, issue there is that we don't have the co proper costing support. We can, you can, the planner gets called to S provide an estimate of how many pages you're going to access for a, a certain type of scan. But uh, we don't have the option to say, like for example, if you do columnar scans, the where clause can be if evaluated in much more efficiently and things like that. I think we're going to have to improve there. I, I don't really, there's a lot more you can do to make columnar execution much, much faster by doing more later in the executor. And there's no support for anything of that. You can do a lot of that by creating the planner hooks and just re 
arranging the planner plan tree or the executor tree by using the custom scan nodes, then you can do basically everything you want to do because you can just have additional callbacks in your AM and use them. Um, but that obviously is not the nicest way to do things. I, we are going to have to work on that. And I hope that uh, Heiki and co who work on ZStore will provide a fair bit of feedback around that. Um, we currently rely on relation, like Postgres uh, heap has relied on uh, relation forks, which is basically that there can be four, exactly four different f underlying logical files for each relation uh, for a long time. And you can only have those and you cannot have more and you cannot have less, really. We, we assume those exist in some way. And that's not good because you might want to actually associate many, many different types of files. You can kind of make that work by just prefixing the files you have inside your AM with um, like subset of the, like an array or like a, just an increasing number inside the file, uh, appended to the file name that's prefixed by the relation fork number, uh, by the relation number. But that's pretty crummy. I think we're going to have to invent a system that you can register additional files because otherwise uh, things like uh, PG rewind and so on will not properly work with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm all out of time and the rest of the limitations aren't that interesting. Any further questions? KO.